Welcome to Defining Moments. I'm Suzanne Quast. Here, we talk about the defining moments that shape our lives in a meaningful way. My next guest is Joel Verlampagos. He is one of the best people that I've ever met. His energy for life is infectious. His passion for what he does illuminates off of him. I think that his story of coming out on national TV to becoming one of reality TV's biggest producers should inspire us all to own our truth openly and courageously. In fact, that's exactly the type of reality TV shows that he is producing now. Here are his moments. Thank you so much. Oh my for being God. Here. This is Thank awesome. you for having me. I'm super psyched. And for those of you who don't know, Joel has produced shows like Pimp My Ride, Back in the Day. Love that show. Oh God. Old Hell's school. Kitchen, Boy Band, yep. uh, The Biggest Loser. You have a secret project coming out. Secret project. And then you also have something you're doing with Ashton Kutcher. Yep. Killing it, crushing the reality game. But I have to say, and one thing that I'm super excited for our guests to hear about is your journey into the industry. I think it's really inspiring and one of the coolest stories I've ever heard. So can you take us back to those days at MTV? And the yeah, show? I mean, um, before MTV, I was pre-med. Okay. And I was supposed to be a doctor. Wow. Because my mom was like, son, you must become doctor. And then like... <laughs> That's, my, how she talks. that's how my mom talks. I have four sisters and they're all supposed to be nurses, but um, I hated pre-med. I okay. hated the side of blood. And then I wanted to also come out of the closet. Okay, that's a so, big thing. And yeah. roughly, how old are you now? 36. Okay, no, when this happened. Oh, I'm I 18. Was like, okay, got it. Um, I'm like roughly right now, no. I'm like 30. <laughs> right, no Ruff, one needs to roughly. Yeah. Um And then right around that time, my dad also had a heart attack. Oh, wow. And so I remember thinking my dad almost passed away without knowing who I am. Mm. So I wanted to come out to him. And then eventually I found out that MTV was doing a documentary about college kids growing up or coming out of the closet. And then they had to propose it as college kids growing up. So I had to lie to my family and say this documentary was about college kids growing up. But it was actually Moly. about coming out of the closet. Moly. Yeah. Okay, had, was it like an ad that you read? And, it was an ad. And so you were like, so then you applied? I wrote my story and then they flew down and like started filming me. And how long was the filming process? Two months. Oh, wow. And this whole time yeah. your family thinks it's about college kids going to college. Correct. When okay. I was actually going to come out to them on camera. Were you nervous? Freaking out. <laughs> it was like the craziest thing in the world. Why? Okay. Why did you choose or why did you think that would be the way to do it? Because I wanted people to know that they had nothing to be ashamed of. And that, you know, it's a hard process. And I wanted to show that process, basically. So what happened? So tell me about the whole experience. And what did your parents say? What did they do? My dad was totally cool with it. My sisters were beyond cool with it. My mom kicked the camera crew out of the house. Wow. Yeah, so they kicked the camera crew out of the house. <laughs> Understandably so. Like, that's like in anything. And then you're, like, looking around, and then there's just nothing but camera crews. Yeah, like I literally was, I'm g And then she, like, kicked the camera crew out. And then the producers, the producers were saying, you know, this is reality, no worries. And this is when I knew I wanted to be a producer. I took my own video camera, put it behind her dinner flowers, told my mom, let's have a conversation. Um, and then we did. And then I came out to her on that tape, sent it to MTV. MTV took it, aired it. The show aired. And then um, the fan base was amazing because kids that were depressed said, you saved my life. Wow. Yeah. So thinking about it, I wanted to be a doctor so that I could save lives. Then I realized there's more than one way to save a life. And, Amen. And that's how I became a producer. That's so inspiring. Yeah. So then your family obviously came around. Mm -hmm. And did they were they okay with the episode? And They were. Yeah. Okay. So then how do you go from that to then now you have this bug of, ah, this is how reality TV works. Yeah. Because so, you said you put in a camera mm -hmm. and then that's when you knew you wanted to... Do, or you were like producing behind the scenes. Yep. How did the, and doing that show then turn into actually becoming a producer? So basically, I called MTV and I was like, hey, can I get a job? And then I was a production assistant. So um, they immediately the were like, sure, you killed it on our show. Yeah. And we will definitely. They were like, you killed it by coming out of the closet. Uh, but now be a production assistant. And so I took that and then I became an associate producer um, for Pimp My Ride, which was insane. Then I became Paris Hilton's associate producer. Really? Um, I didn't so know I that. So I followed her around for a bit. Yeah. And what was that like? It was 
a 21 year old with a camera following Paris Hilton around. <laughs> It's what you would imagine. It's exactly what what you think it is, yeah. So do you think now, back then, that reality TV was more reality? Because now there's this whole idea, and you tell me, maybe I'm wrong, yeah. or this conception that, or this idea that reality TV isn't real now. It's scripted, but sort of real, and the producers are kind of behind the scenes, like yeah. being puppeteers. Do you think it's that way, or is it? No, I mean, it's like some shows are different, but um, reality TV is still very much real. Like, I'm into the life-changing doc type of reality shows versus um, the entertainment type of follow docs. Got it. If that makes any sense. Like when I did The Biggest Loser, the weight loss wasn't CGI. That was, you know, we've lost over 33,000 pounds of fat. Wow. Um, and so that just proves to you that reality very much is real. How did you get to be a part of The Biggest Loser? I didn't watch it when um, I was growing up. I was like, what is this show about? Okay. Big people that want to lose weight. Uh -huh. I'm like, okay. And then one day after Hell's Kitchen, I just needed a job. I interviewed and then I absolutely fell in love um, with the show. And so I spent a whole weekend watching episodes of The Biggest Loser and then um, I fell in love with it. So you said, you told yourself, I'm going to one day be executive producer of that show. That's right. Did you put that like on a vision board? Was this something? I ingrained it in my head. So at this point I had worked on several shows at MTV and then I did um, Hell's Kitchen and then I did another show for NBC. So it was kind of like dating. Okay. And then, then eventually I told myself I had to get married to a show. <laughs> Um, so I'm like, I gotta stop fooling around with all these shows. Um, and then I started working The Biggest Loser and saw how powerful um, and how impactful it was to so many people. And at that time, you know, America was the fattest country um, in the world, wow. quote unquote. And so to be able to work on that show was, was really meaningful for me. So I put it in my head and then eventually moved from an associate producer to story producer to supervising producer to co-executive producer and then executive producer. That's um, so cool. Yeah, marriage. I mean, you did. You fully went in. I, I went in. <laughs> you did it. Honeymoon at all. So that's about how many years was that? Seven. Seven years. Yeah. So what does, okay, excuse my ignorance, but in no. uh, reality TV, what does a story producer do? Are they in charge of the actual story? Correct. Of the so because it's reality, we don't script out what, you know, people will say, what contestants will say. So there is no show unless there's story. Yep. And so we're filming hundreds of hours of stuff. The story producer is going to take the top 5% of what you will actually see. Wow. Yeah. So that's what I mean about, you know, you, we have the power to manipulate anything, uh -huh. but I love the responsibility of telling an honest story. You know. So does that mean you just sit there and watch tons of footage, or does that mean you're also then there 24/7 to try to hear what people are saying and say that was a good moment, document that? That's right. So I'll be in a control room watching um, things as they're happening live, hoping that good TV is going to happen. Yeah. Um, and then when something great happens, we jot it down. We take those scenes footage and then we put it together in post and then you've got a 30 minute or one hour long show. Wow. Yeah. What do you recall any of the most moving moments on that show? Because I would imagine there's a yeah. lot because that's a really I would imagine too when you're dealing with weight loss. It's not just about the weight, but it's the issues behind right. the weight. Yep. So do you recall any of your, I guess, favorite or most meaningful moments? Yeah, I mean, show? it's always when the contestants were coming out of the bus when they first arrived and you're like, holy crap, there's no way that this, there's no way that they're going to lose weight. This is going to be a tough um, season. And then they do it. Like, it just shows you the power of like their will and why they're doing this. And you find out that the prize isn't the money, it's actually like gaining years of your life back Ugh. and seeing like a dad being able to walk her daughter down the aisle um, is really the prize at the end of the day and being able to like love yourself before you love other people I think is a huge part of The Biggest Loser. You don't get to 500 pounds just because you love pizza. There's always You're something deeper. Right. Yeah, and so it's a, it was a crazy boot camp. We put them in this facility, which is our set, and then they have nothing but explore deep down, you know, why they got to where they were. And then there's therapists and- There's therapists, yeah, and, like and trainers and all that stuff. That's so cool. Yeah. So then, okay, so you were there for eight years. Yep. And then what finally, what, like what was the deciding factor to move on? Deciding factor to move on, um, 
I just probably shouldn't compare this part to a marriage anymore. Uh, <laughs> or maybe. <laughs> or maybe. I um, had done weight loss for so long that I eventually looked back at my credits, my resume, and I said, oh, it would be fun to do a music um, stage type of show, which I had never done mm -hmm. um, before ever, much more live, because the only live show I'd done before was the, the season finale for Biggest Loser. Okay. And so I uh, eventually left The Biggest Loser and then moved over to ABC where I did Boy Band, where I saw lots of you. Which I saw lots of you, Yeah, yes. which I loved. Boy Band mm -hmm. was so much fun. It was the best summer of my life. I mean... It was 100% the best But then time. how did you even come up? Like, did you come up with the idea? Was it positioned to you? Or? ABC came up with the idea, and then um, they brought me on. Um, and I was just so grateful for it, because the 16-year-old in me was just, like, losing his mind. No, so that we I should get say, it was Finding me. America's Next Boy Band. Yeah, right. Exactly which right. Which was so much fun, which was so great in real life. And they're doing really well. They're doing really well. I just saw them last week at the Troubadour. And, like, people were, like, losing their minds. And just to think a year ago, they weren't in a boy band and, you know, millions of people voted for those five. And then seeing how far they've come today, you're just like. I feel like you do a lot of shows like with what we were saying is a yep. lot of heart. Yep. They're, they're meaningful. They change people's lives. They give people opportunities that they might not normally have. Yep. Is that intentional on your part? Yeah, I mean, it's like I want to work on shows that I would actually watch. You know, I think you don't necessarily watch everything in TV. I don't necessarily watch everything in TV because you have to be passionate about what you do, mm -hmm. you know, because it's not a nine to five job being a producer. It's nine to one in the morning. Yeah. You know, so you really, really, really have to love what you do and you love what you do by working on shows that you're passionate about. And for me, it's feel good shows that give back. Got it, yeah. which I love the feel good shows because in this right now with the time we live in, it could be one of those things where, you know, people are what are you talking about? What do you people. Mean? Yeah. People are, you know, I don't know. We also don't have the attention spans that we once had. Mm -hmm. We don't sit down and we get invested. Mm -hmm. I feel like it could be easy. I don't I don't want to use the term, but to sell out. Right. But to then maybe do things that maybe you wouldn't watch. Right. Just for the paycheck. And yeah. I appreciate the fact that you're not. Yeah. Thank you. Amen to that. Bam. Did you, okay, so the hours are crazy. The hours, hours are crazy. Are, did you ever have a moment where it was too much? Where you were like, I can't do this? Yeah, so there was a moment. Um, I remember thinking that no one's gonna look back at their life and go, oh, I wish I worked more. Like, I wish I really like worked more hours and, you know, gave up my social <laughs> life and just work more, <laughs> you know? So I remember thinking, after my last season of The Biggest Loser, um, like it was good. Like on paper, like my life was good, um, making good money, an, exec an executive producer, you know, living in West Hollywood. Um, but eventually, I just felt like there was still something lacking. At that time, I also had gotten out of a breakup, and so it was just my moment to like really define like who I was, other yeah. than the things that you see on paper. Mm -hmm. um, and so. I completely pulled an eat, pray, love, and I um, didn't work, chose to not work for several months because I was gonna go to Bali by myself. Which is which so is cool. what I did, and I had never done anything by myself before then. I was always with coworkers, friends, family, or in a relationship, um, so I literally packed my bags um, and just wanted to unplug. I think Los Angeles is such a beautiful city, but there's so much stuff that happens that you kind of, you can lose yourself. You're absolutely you know, right. Which is why meditation's so powerful, but also so hard. Because mm -hmm. it's so hard for us to just like sit still and actually just yeah. be present. What do you think you learned during that three month that, Eat, Pray, um, Love experience? That I was defining myself and putting myself in this puny box of identity. Uh -huh. And that there was so much more to me other than um, my job and being a boyfriend or being even a son or a brother, there is something else in me um, that is connected to the universe in a much bigger way. Wow. And so in times when I am sad or I think I'm not worthy of anything, I just remind myself that like, holy crap, I went to Bali on my own. <laughs> <laughs> I love that the 
like not like I created this, you know, this yeah. this name in LA. Right. I was an executive producer for one of the biggest mm-hmm. shows. Not that, but that I went to Bali on my own. That's highlight of my life. That's going to Bali so on my own. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, and then from there, then you went to boy band. Yes. Yep. Got it. Okay. Yep. And then now you have a couple of things in the fire. I do. I have um, a secret project. Okay. Um, and then, but the other show uh, that I am working on is also, uh, the other show that I'm working on is with um, Ashton Kutcher as an so executive cool. producer. And speaking of, you know, giving back to the community and shedding light on awareness and whatnot is that uh, it's about the $1.5 trillion student loan debt. Which um, is real, people. It is, it is real. real. It's second to mortgages. It's higher than credit card loans and auto loans. Um, and 44 million Americans owe collectively $1.5 trillion. Jeez. $1.5 trillion. And so the government, in you know, by the end of this year, would have made 10 to $15 billion dollars and profit based off of, you know, these kids that are just trying to get an education. That was me. My yeah. student loans were $1,000 a month. That's a lot. That's yeah. insane. That's like unfathomable. Who can survive when you're yeah. just getting out of school and you're like, here, good luck paying that. That's and right. you have your rent and you have to find a job. And That's right. It's, mm-hmm. So then what's the premise of the show? The Is premise, it- so the average student graduates with about $34,000 in student loan debt. We're covering millennials um, that have $100,000, $200,000 plus in student loan debt. So in each episode, there's a millennial that's drowning in debt. And then we have the CEO of a company. Um, his name's Dan Rosenzweig. He's amazing. And, of what company? Uh, Chegg. Okay. Which is basically the Netflix of textbooks. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it's him and a financial expert that we have. They visit uh, Millennial in each episode and they show them without giving them any money, you know, how to get out of debt um, based off of like where they're at right now. That's so interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so valuable. Because right. I feel like not only are they getting the information, but then so is everybody else that's who's right. watching it. I really feel like I'm a disappointed. I'm a disappointed. I'm disappointed <laughs> that you didn't have this when I was younger. So I'm a disappointed too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm actually super excited for all of those. I feel like all my nieces and nephews, yeah. all of all my cousins, they can definitely learn from this. Right. And it's like if you think about it, the biggest loser. We didn't do any surgery with them to get the fat off. It was literally eat right, work out hard. And for this, to get these kids, millennials, out of student loan debt, we're not giving them any money. We're just going to show them actually how to have a responsible financial life, you know, because it's all there. You just have to, like, do the right things. Which is kind of crazy because I feel like, you know, in my mind, I'm like, oh, if I had the money to do it. But you're right. If you actually have the skill set and the tools to know how to save, how to pay off what you should be paying off first. That's right. Yeah. That's very, you know, that's very valuable. Yeah. How many episodes have you guys shot? Uh, We're we're filming a total of 10. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to be filming until mid-November. And then uh, finish editing by the end of the year. And then you'll package it and then sell it. Exactly. And then how did you get involved or why is Ashton doing this? Did he have student loans or was this something? I don't feel like he did. I mean, he's such an amazing businessman. He's so good with um, uh, anything that has to do with finances that he wanted to come up with a show like this to shed light on a gigantic national crisis. Mm -hmm. He came up with it and then um, he did a bunch of meetings with companies and executive producers. I was fortunate to be one of those people. And then at the end of the day, we partnered up. Yeah. Did you have to give a pitch? I did. Did you? I did. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm like pitching to Ashton Kutcher. That's so cool. What'd you say? We just like afterwards dropped the mic? That's a, yeah, we're like, what's up? <laughs> you got this lighting. You gave your pitch. This lighting's then, amazing, I by know, the way. I, I literally like want this lighting in my office. <laughs> well, now after these mm. shows, you two can have it. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I like okay, it. Okay, well, I want to end our segment with the questions that I ask yep. all of my guests. Yep. Um, the first question is, what's the most... Dis- Lela? What's the most difficult decision you've had to make to fulfill your greater purpose? The most difficult decision I had to make to fulfill my greater purpose was choosing to not work for almost a year so that I can travel um, the world, specifically going to Bali by myself. Um, 
for a summer. Was there a part of you that was worried about the rat race of like, yeah. I have to stay relevant. I yeah. just came off this huge show. Now That's I right. have to get something. And it's like, you know, we live in a city where people are replaceable. Like if you're not going to take the show, somebody else is going to come in and swoop it off uh, your feet and just like do that. And so I did feel like I was going to be replaced, but man, I had to like have faith that when I would come back that people would still want me. Mm -hmm. um, luckily that was the case, but um, that was the most difficult decision. I bet. Just because it's like I've had, you know, stability with work mm -hmm. and whatnot, but then to be able to say, nope, I'm good. Um, was scary, uh, but yeah. I'm so glad I did it. But you know what? I think that's a beautiful lesson and something mm. I'm trying to work uh, with on myself, and that's this idea of faith. Yep. Having the like faith to know that like this is right for you now, yep. and the best outcome will happen because you're living in your truth. Yep, that's right. So good for you. Thank you. Um, who and what do you do for inspiration? I um, I camp a lot. <laughs> Camp? I camp. I you know. a camper? I know. <laughs> no, no. I camp a you lot. Should see how I, this man is dressed. There's no I way. Put, I put, um, you know, my two dogs in the car. Put my tent, sleeping bag in there. Then we'll just drive a couple hours and just like unplug from LA. Look at the really? stars. Yeah. It's like red wine, campfire, Mumford and Sons is playing. There's like stars up there. It's like my favorite thing. You know, I did one camping trip. I um, camped or I hiked up to the uh, Machu Picchu. Oh, we cool. did the four days and five, or I'm sorry, four nights and five days. Yeah. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've decided I'm a retired camper. You're that. over it. I'm over it. I Some can't people do are into camping. Yeah, it's like damp and wet and it's just, oh, yeah. Those are awful words. <laughs> <laughs> then you must have a really good sleeping bag. Yeah. That's all I can say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, what are your keys to success? Mm. Keys to success is, um, for me, I like to um, see it as I'm getting paid to be a kid. I think as mm. when we're kids, you have so much imagination. Um, you know, if you and I were kids right now, we could pretend like we're on a boat. And in our heads, our creativity is really taking control of um, our environment. Right. But I think like as we grow up, adulting happens, life happens, and then you lose that creativity that you had as a kid. And as a producer, your job is to come up with an idea and then make that concept concrete. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't come up with any good ideas unless you're actually in that kid mode. You know, it's kind of like why Peter Pan was such an important movie, because it reminds you to never grow up like in here. Um, what a great life lesson. Yeah. So true. It is, because I've never came up with a good idea when I was having a bad day or when I'm stressed out. Like when I'm stressed out and I go, oh, you know what's a really good TV <laughs> show idea while I'm pissed right now and want to punch a wall? Is punching this. people in traffic. Punching people in traffic. <laughs> Tonight on Punching People in Traffic. Um, but yeah, you just have to put yourself in a good space. Is there any idea that you have that hasn't been created yet, but that you have the idea? I do. I do, but because it feels like everything has been done, mm -hmm. um, I just have to really have to keep, keep tweaking and finessing and crafting that idea until it's perfect. Yep. So. If you could define the legacy you want to leave behind with a couple of words, what would it be? Um, smile through everything that you do. Mm. Just because it's your mind will literally listen to, your life is going to follow your thoughts, right? So yeah. you just have to, Smile through work, smile through, you know, love and relationships and friendships. And um, even when you're pissed off in traffic, like your mind's going to go, oh, you're pissed? OK, I'll be pissed. Um, but just the power of being able to smile, even when you don't feel like it, is such a good so exercise. Do you do that? Like if you're a kid, we've been using traffic I a lot, do. are you just like smiling? Through yeah, the right. I'm like, can you get out of the way, please? <laughs> Thank you. I'm really happy. Yeah. I am really happy. Yeah. But, it, but it's true. It's like being able to. I mean, here's how I see it, is that like um, uh, our hearts or whatever, it's like a projector, right? Like a movie projector. It's just going to keep on like shining. Like our mind is actually just going to keep on shining things. Um, so whatever thought we put in front of it is going to be the movie that it's just going to project because the mind's just going to keep projecting things. Yeah. But if I'm like, okay, I'm going to watch a scary movie today, like that's what you're going to watch. But if you choose to watch a comedy, um, that's what you're going to see. So being able to be mindful enough and say, like, I'm going to smile today, you know, like and it I'm goes such a long way. I'm just going to replace that negative way. thought. Yeah. To put it. it doesn't mean like, f like forget about it, acknowledge it. Um, but yeah, choosing positivity basically is the legacy. 
Okay, one more question. Yeah. And then we're finished. All right. Okay, so what is the hardest thing you've had to deal with in the industry that you're in? The hardest thing I've had to deal with in the industry that I'm in is just the amount of hours and constantly reminding yourself that you have to balance your life, not forget about your life outside of work. Okay. You know, when I die one day, I certainly don't want my tombstone to read Joel Rolampiga's executive producer, but I still believe in my job so much that I want to work a gazillion hours in a week, um, but also not forgetting about my family, my friends, my two dogs, and, you know, all that stuff. Thank you, guys. What an amazing, inspiring story Joel has. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did because he's one of the greatest human beings that I've ever met. Uh, I No, I really mean it. Stop it more. Okay. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye.